Hi, all. Um, this is Lauren Flynn with the American Wind Wildlife Institute. I want to welcome you to today's webinar on wind energy and sage grouse. Uh, before we dive in to the agenda, I want to review a few logistics with you. So most of you are joining us through your computers, and you should be able to hear us through your speakers or headphones. And um, there's no need to dial into the phone line. We'll be doing all questions uh, through the webinar room. If you have any technical trouble during the webinar, uh, please send an email to Ian Evans, our research associate, uh, at ievans at awwi.org, and he can help uh, with troubleshooting issues. And you can also send over to me any logistics questions or problems through the questions box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And that is also how we will be taking questions uh, through the webinar system. So to do so, you should see a dialog box at the bottom right-hand corner there. Please type your question into that box and um, hit, click the button at the right to hit enter and send it over to AWWI. You'll be able to see the questions that you have submitted to us, um, but not those submitted by others. And we can take those throughout the presentation, so as soon as they come to mind, please uh, go ahead and send them over. And then we will um, address those after the presentation. And for those of you who are, um, who are on the phone line, if you can please remember to mute your phone um, so we can avoid background noise, that would be much appreciated. Turning to the uh, agenda for today, um, First, I'm going to go over uh, some brief background on the Sage Grouse Research Collaborative. We'll be hearing results from the two research projects that have been um, conducted over the past few years under this collaborative. So I want to make sure everyone has that um, information about the collaborative itself. And then we will uh, turn to the, the two research results presentations, uh, which I'll, I'll introduce the speakers um, after the background. And uh, we will do a, a short round of Q&A after the first presentation, and then um, pick back up with questions for both presentations at the end. And we are scheduled for an hour and a half, but um, if we get through all the questions, we may wrap up early. We'll, we'll see how many questions come in. OK, so some background on the Sage Grouse Research, Collab Sage -Grouse Research Collaborative. This was formed in 2010 under the National Wind Coordinating Collaborative. And the National Wind Coordinating Collaborative, or the NWCC, is a collaborative effort around wind energy that has been working on wildlife and other issues since 1994. And the American Wind Wildlife Institute, or AWWI, which is where I work, um, currently facilitates the NWCC under a contract with the National Renewable Energy Lab. And funding for the the work under the NWCC is provided by both AWWI and Department of Energy through NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab. The goal of the collaborative uh, is to coordinate studies examining the potential impact of wind energy development on sage grouse across their range in order to inform wind development and sage grouse management strategies. And when the collaborative was formed, they put together research protocols and a request for proposals for uh, potential research projects on wind energy and sage grouse. And the purpose of, of doing this work in a collaborative format is that it helps ensure that rigorous peer-reviewed approach um, is used for the research designs. It enables the involvement of multiple stakeholders and a coordinated approach to funding these projects. And um, it ensures that the results are, are useful of quality and that they're communicated um, with the wider community. The collaborative originally selected uh, three research projects to fund um, back in 2011. Uh, but one was put on hold several years ago when the proposed WIND project that the research was uh, designed around decided not to move forward. So in this slide here, you see information on the, the two projects that we're going to hear about today. Uh, one project is a before-after control impact design, or BACI design. And that's being conducted at the proposed Chokecherry Sierra Madre wind farm in Wyoming. 
And the other project is a post-construction only study that is being conducted at Pacific Core's Seven Mile Hill Wind Farm. The, um, the collaborative is kind of operates with the oversight committee and um, they include volunteer stakeholders from agencies, academia, conservation organizations, and wind developers. And they operate under a set of protocols that, that were agreed to by the group um, as, as it was found, being founded. And you can see the current list of members here on the slide. Um, I, I won't read those out. But um, there's also been many others who have supported this, this effort over the years and with their time and expertise. And um, for those of you on the phone, thank you very much for your involvement. I want to also acknowledge the significant funding that has been awarded um, to the collaborative to support the research projects. Uh, this funding has come from the Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Department of Energy through NREL, and um, several sources of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service funding through uh, some of the LCCs and the multi-state conservation grant program. Um, there's also been significant matching funding that's been awarded to each project directly from a variety of sources. Um, so uh, thank you all for the support for this important work. So now we're going to turn to the two presentations uh, of research results, and this is based on kind of the results to date from the two projects. We're going to start by hearing from Chad LeBeau with West, who will present on the post-construction study at Seven Mile Hill. And Chad designs, implements, and analyzes wildlife research studies throughout the U.S. He's a research biologist with West in Laramie and has been conducting wildlife studies across the western U.S. since 2006. His research focuses on sage grouse population biology, but has studied numerous other species. His current research includes evaluating mule deer survival in southern Colorado, the effects of wind energy facility on lesser prairie chickens in Kansas, and the effects of transmission lines on sage grouse populations. And then, um, as I mentioned, after Chad gives his presentation, we'll uh, take some questions for him. And for those who are, are just joining us, please type your questions into the dialog box at the bottom right-hand corner of your webinar screen to send them over to us, and please send them over whenever um, they come up. And then um, after that, we'll hear from Chris Hansen with the University of Missouri, who will present on the Backy study at the proposed Chokecherry Sierra Madre site. And Chris, I'll, I'll go over your bio um, before you speak. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chad. I will pull up your PowerPoint here, Chad, and if you can unmute and take it away. Great. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Lauren. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the introduction on the background of the NWCP collaborative. I can't uh, uh, emphasize it enough that it was a big part in this research, and so we're uh, very appreciative of that support. Uh, this study, um, is also an individual collaborative effort between uh, West Inc., uh, our fellow uh, co-workers there, and uh, Wyoming Wildlife Consultants um, with Matt Holleran and Eli Rodemaker, and then the University of Wyoming with, uh, with Jeff Beck. So um, uh, this has been a collaborative effort, and we presented on some of our results of the past few web webinars, and um, I'm excited to, to be here today to present uh, some of our final results after our six-year post-construction monitoring study. It's uh, loading here. Here we go. Um, so in, in introduction, um, the purpose of this study was to investigate the potential impact of wind energy on uh, habitat selection and, and survival parameters. And um, I, I do present a lot of information here. Uh, however, we feel it's important to present um, all these parameters in one presentation so that we get a clear picture of the uh, maybe the cumulative effects of, of this wind energy project on the stage grouse population. Uh, so it's going to be re really results heavy and, and uh, more discussion heavy. But uh, again, we're going to focus on um, identifying whether the, the, the facility uh, display sage grouse during the, the nesting, broodering, and summer period, and then also look at nest survival, broodering survival, and, and adult uh, female survival. 
So our, our starting located, it started was located in uh, in southeastern Wyoming, uh, near the towns of Medicine Bow and Hanna. Um, it consisted of, of, of nine different LECs, and uh, we uh, captured females at treatment area LECs. These LECs were located in the facility, and then directly south of that, uh, we had a control area, uh, which we, we dubbed it the Simpson Ridge Control. And this gives you a layout of where our LECs were located relative to uh, the facility and, and the turbines. Uh, some pictures um, for you all to, to see. The, the top two pictures are, are uh, the one on the right is, uh, is Simpson uh, Ridge proper, and then one on the left is the Seven Mile Hill study site, and obviously the turbines on the bottom. So just to give you a feel of, of where our project is located. So briefly, our field method. Um, our study occurred uh, from 2009 to 2014. Uh, the, the facility became op operational in December of 2008. So. Uh, we initiated the post construction monitoring effort um, that spring after uh, construction and monitored through 2014. Over this time period, we, we captured uh, females, uh, 346 females, um, and it was relatively equally between the treatment and the control area. Uh, we fitted them with the VHF telemetry uh, collars weighing about 22 grams, and these last about uh, two years. Uh, so again, to give you a, a a brief overview of our study outline. Um, uh, again, we're presenting a lot of information here, but we feel it's important to, uh, to get the big picture. So we're looking at habitat selection. Uh, did females select nest sites um, uh, further away from turbines? Uh, were broodering locations located for further from turbines? And then overall summer locations. How did that uh, use compare to habitats close to the facility? And again, with survival, uh, did, are, are the, the nest survival um, uh, is nest survival impacted in habitats closer to the facility? Same with brood and adult survival. So we're first going to um, uh, talk about our covariate data uh, briefly. Uh, we considered a number of different um, covariates in our in our habitat selection analysis and our survival analysis. Um, provided a lot of uh, information on, on hopefully explain the, the variability in um, survival and selection um, at, the pro at the study areas. And briefly, here's a, a uh, picture of our herbaceous cover um, habitat data layer. And if you notice, we have two time periods, 2009 to 2011 and 2012 to 2014. Uh, we incorporated two uh, NAEP imagery into our analysis. And so one was captured in 2009 and one was captured in 2012. And so we, we utilized the, the different varying time periods of, of habitat covariates in our, in our analysis. Um, so briefly for our habitat selection, um, uh, we in our survival in our survival in our modeling efforts, uh, we attempted to control for potentially confounding factors in the environmental conditions. Uh, we wanted to get the best environmental model that we could based on topography and vegetation, and then we would um, apply an anthropogenic effect, which include transmission lines, major roads, um, and these are features on landscape that are, are known to influence stage grouse. Uh, parameters, and uh, we, we thought it was really important to try to control for those before we are adding any uh, uh, turbine effect. And so that's how our analysis methods um, went. Um, so if we jump into habitat selection, um, uh, the, the image on the right is uh, where our nest, nest sites were located throughout the, the study period, and um, those the, the, bound, the bounding boxes there are our home ranges, um, and those were where, where we use the identify available habitat. And just looking at the raw data, um, the figure on the left there is, is the average distance to turbine. Um, you know, we see some variability from year to year, but uh, relatively consistent over the, the six-year period. Um, so when we incorporate all of the habitat information, including all those covariates I, I spoke about, into our uh, discrete choice habitat selection model. Um, we found that these covariates were, were most important in nest site selection. Um, however, we did not determine the effect of turbine uh, on uh, nest site selection. So uh, it appears that they continue to select habitats um, in and around the facility uh, for their nest site location. Uh, if, we, if we move the brooder in habitat selection, um, again, the figure uh, on the right is, is showing where we observed uh, uh, females rearing their broods. And, and, the, and the, the graph on the left, again, shows 
um, you know, again, some variability in selection relative to turbines. Um, uh, but once we incorporate all the environmental features and the anthropogenic and the topographic features, um, we do get a uh, effect of the facility on, on broodery and habitat selection. So uh, we saw that the percentage of uh, surface disturbance, so this is access roads and turbine pads, um, uh, the density or the proportion of that density uh, within 1,200 meters uh, of a point on location was influencing uh, broodery and habitat selection. Um, so it's interesting that the, the density was coming out rather than uh, distance to turbine, for example. Uh, we also tested for time lag effects. Um, sage grouse um, tend to visit the same habitats year after year. Uh, they have strong site fidelity. And so we tested for whether uh, selection differed from the first three years of uh, following development to the last three years of following development. And we did see a significant time lag effect, or we did see the uh, effect of turbines um, uh, on broodering and habitat selection uh, was at a greater magnitude three years following development, suggesting maybe there is a, a time lag effect um, as, as time goes by after the construction on brood rearing. Uh, summer habitat selection, these are um, locations that were not included in the brood rearing habitat analysis and um, um, were locations that were from females uh, following brood rearing, late brood rearing habitat, so 35 days post patch. And this is through October, so this is kind of that the late summer period. Um, again, um, we're seeing some variability in, um, in selection relative to turbine. Um, you can see that it increases and, and starting to, to increase in the last two years there. That's similar to brood rearing. Um, as we incorporate all these vegetation and habitat features, uh, we did see a, a negative effect of a uh, percentage of um, uh, surface disturbance. Uh, especially with the wind farm. So uh, brood rearing and, and, and females after the brood rearing period appear to be selected away from the facility. So in summary of our, our habitat selection, uh, turbine locations did not by affect nest site location. Uh, females shifted their patterns after, the, after they hatched nests and um, were raising their broods. And uh, late barren and, and uh, summering females uh, selected for habitats away from the turbines. And it's important to note that density of turbines is more important than proximity. So uh, they appear to be selecting habitats on the fringes, but um, uh, deep in the facility where there's higher density of roads and, and turbines, we, we see this avoidance. And so th there's a no effect on nests, um, a negative effect of 1.2 kilometers uh, in the brood rain in summer. And the 1.2 kilometers is, uh, again, that density estimate. So a point on the landscape is buffered by 1.2 kilometers and the amount of surface disturbance that is within that buffer um, accounts for your, your percentage of surface disturbance. So uh, that's where we get the 1.2 kilometer from. So if we, if we jump to survival now, um, uh, again, here's a brief method uh, on, our, on our survival. We combine all of our data from both study areas. Uh, you talked to proportional hazards. Net survival is up to 28 days. Root survival was 37 days post-patch. And, and female survival was captured through October. And we also incorporated this, uh, a random effect of LEC. Um, we felt that it was important to maybe uh, test whether there was a LEC effect on, on survival during each of these periods. Um, maybe there's something on the landscape that we weren't picking up in our, in our analysis, um, but that it's captured at LEC. And so uh, we wanted to make sure that we, we captured that as well. Uh, so here's our uh, figure of our nest survival. The, the failed are, are red um, dots, and uh, the blue um, are successful nest, nests. Um, and, and these are the, the habitat features um, that we uh, found to be most important in nest survival. And, and, this, and our survival methods differed a little bit from our, our habitat selection, where we considered all possible models. So all those suite of covariates were combined into one. Uh, model selection process, and, and these were the, the most influential. And, and we did not see a turbine effect during the, the nest survival period. If we move to brood survival, uh, similar to, to nest, uh, we did not see a, a negative effect on um, survival rel in habitats relative to turbines. Um, we did, however, ca capture a, a random effect of, of 
of lack of capture. So we did see significant frailty effects, and these are these are lex where females were captured from, um, and they reared their re reared their brood. And um, when we saw these negative effects, that was the really bad neighborhoods. Um, and when we have the, the positive frailty effects, and that was the really good neighborhood. So there's something driving that. Uh, on the landscape, maybe there's cobra we didn't pick up, um, or or what? But we so we did not uh, we did detect these significant frailty effects, and um, however, uh, we didn't detect any significant uh, effect at the at the cap at the uh, seven mile hill lake or the the treatment area lake. Um, so we're, we feel pretty confident that you know we did capture the variability in the uh, parameters at the at the treatment area, but uh, south of the highway in the in the control. Um, there was a, an elect effect, so there was the elect that had a really bad neighborhood and an elect that had a really good neighborhood for brood rearing. So if we, if we uh, jump to the summer uh, or the, the female adult female survival, um, again went through all model selection and we came up with this uh, environmental model there in the in the, uh, in the white those covariates, and, and in this time we did see an effect uh, percentage of, of surface disturbance. Um, so so females. Um, that were using habitats that made the choice to select habitats in higher density of, of turbines and access roads, uh, we actually saw higher survival. Um, and this also coincides with what was found in Kansas with greater prairie chicken, um, and that was the pre- and post-construction study, and they saw high, higher adult uh, female survival post-development. Um, so that's, that's an interesting uh, note to, that we found is that um, uh, we did have higher uh, survival, closer to determined, and, and higher density. Uh, we did conduct a concurrent avian predator monitoring study where we had a bunch of point locations located throughout the, the both study areas. And, and we did find that uh, avian predator density was uh, lower in habitats closer to the facility. So um, the eagles and the, and the raptors uh, may be avoiding these, these dense, high dense areas and allowing for um, adult females to have higher survival. Uh, this is a, a, a figure of percentage of per facility disturbance and, and adult survival time. So the, the green line is 3% of the surface disturbance, and we, that's where we saw the highest um, adult survival. And then as we moved away from the facility uh, beyond uh, 800 meters, um, because that was our, our density estimator there, uh, we start seeing um, lower survival, just uh, looking at specific to, to percentage of facility disturbance. So in summary, our, our nest and brood survival were not impacted by the turbines. Uh, we observed a, a positive effect of the percentage of disturbance on female survival. And as I mentioned, um, you know, this was also found, found in greater prairie chickens in Kansas. Um, uh, still some, some more information to, to be held there. Um, nest and, and brood ryan, uh, we did not see a, a, a effect on, on survival. Uh, so in conclusion, if we, we put all this together um, and Try and figure out maybe the, the cumulative effects of of the facility on a sage grouse annual cycle. Um, we saw that females continue to select nests in and around the facility, uh, and those nests seem to be not influenced by the survival of those nests did not seem to be influenced by the facility. However, once the females uh, uh, hatched and started raising their broods, uh, we saw them start moving away from less dense areas into maybe uh, um, the fringe of the facility, and, and again, same in the in the summer period, they shifted away. And however, that resulted in, in no negative effects of, of brood rearing uh, survival or adult survival. So um, it's interesting to note that to put this all together, that yeah, we did see some avoidance. Um, however, that avoidance does not uh, appear to equate to um, any loss of, of fitness parameters. Um, so in management recommendations, you know, it is important to note that this is the first uh, study investigating the potential impact of wind energy on stage grouse. And uh, Chris's study is, is another study that is um, trying to reach at some of the uh, accumulative effects and, and partly why the, the co collaborative was formed. You know, it's difficult to take um, results from one study and, and make it applicable across the range of stage grouse. Um, uh, we all know that stage grouse populations differ, uh, whether they're migratory or uh, non-migratory, uh, and the habitats that they occupy are different. They may have to go select uh, different habitats uh, based on where they're located. And 
And all that will influence uh, turbines location, facility location. So it's important to note that this is the first study, and um, uh, it is really specific to the, this site. Um, you know, we, we're recommending that facilities with similar disturbance footprint to our facility. Remember, uh, the proportion of disturbance was the most important. It wasn't number of turbines. It wasn't distance to turbines. Um, uh, you know, we're suggesting that if you have a similar footprint, number of acres lost, um, uh, you know, that, that could, our results could be comparable um, um, to elsewhere. And so we're recommending uh, facilities be placed 1.2 kilometers away from any, any occupied nesting brood during the summer habitat. Um, and the 1.2, again, comes from uh, that proportion of disturbance. The point on landscape is buffered by 1,200 meters. Um, and, the, and the surface disturbance uh, associated with that buffer is divided by the overall area. And that's where you get your percentage. So uh, beyond 1.2 kilometers, we had zero uh, surface disturbance. Um, and so that's um, where we're uh, comfortable right now at, at uh, recommending a, a 1.2 kilometer buffer. Uh, so for, for next steps, um, um, we're working closely with the NWCC and um, other agency folks to try and um, um, initiate a new objective at the, at the study area. Um, and, and this is looking at movement. Um, Chris's project is a, um, uh, the Chokecherry Sierra Madre have GPS backpacks, and you can get very detailed information on, on daily movements of stage routes. And unfortunately, with our VHF information, um, you know, our, our intervals were spaced too far apart to actually uh, document movement patterns. Um, however, through the analysis process, you know, if we just connect the simply connect the dots, we do see a lot of movements back and forth between LEC, um, uh, different key habitats um, in and around the facility. And, and it's unknown to us whether they are venturing around the facility, uh, you know, meandering through, or, or, or bolting straight across. And so um, it would be interesting to, to see how um, turbines affect movement. And, and, and we like to, to try and capture that this spring and, and implementing a new objective at Seven Mile Hill. So, uh, we're looking for funding partners and more collaboratives to, to continue this research out here because we, we feel it would be an important aspect to uh, stage grouse management in, in uh, occupied wind habitat. So with that, um, feel free to email me anytime if you have questions um, or if you need a copy of our report. Uh, we just um, published our report on our website. Uh, we're going through the publication process now. Uh, reviewing comments as we speak, and so hopefully have that um, published within the year. Um, so if you have any questions, um, feel free to email or call any time. I'd be happy to answer them. And I think that's all I have, Lauren. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Chad. So we'll, uh, we'll take a few questions um, right now on Chad's presentation before we go to the next one. So if you have a question, please type it into the box at the bottom right-hand corner of your webinar screen there and send it over. Uh, one question has come in that has come in is, uh, will this presentation be available? And Chad, we will be able to post this on the NWCC website, correct? Yes, yes. And I believe um, our NWCC report is on the, on the website as well, I think. Um, yeah, this presentation is great to, to summarize everything, but uh, to really get all the details, um, I would encourage people to, to go to the report and, and look there as well. Great. So we'll, we'll get this information up on the website after the webinar and emailed out to all the registrants so you can reference it. I don't – there's no questions that have come in so far. So I guess that means you were very thorough, Ted. <laughs> uh, so I guess let's uh, go ahead and turn to Chris. So um, Chris, I'm going to pull up your PowerPoint, and then I'll read your bio. Uh, so Chris Hansen received his MS degree in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife Sciences at the University of Missouri in 2009. His thesis focused on estimating uh, rough grouse occupancy and developing a monitoring protocol for future rough grouse surveys in the Black Hills National Forest, South Dakota. Chris became a field manager for the study researching uh, sage grouse brood ecology in 2010 and has been involved in sage grouse research ever since. His primary interests include conducting research that facilitates wildlife conservation and management. 
So Chris, are you still with us? And if you can unmute, and I'll turn it over to you. Yep, I'm here. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks everybody for uh, for coming and listening today. Uh, so today I'm going to discuss some of the main results from my team's research on the ecology of male sage grouse in relation to wind energy development in Wyoming. So uh, first, a little background regarding the history of our projects. Uh, the power company of Wyoming propo proposed to build a 1,000 turbine wind energy facility on the Overland Trail Ranch, which is located in south central Wyoming. The facility is projected to produce 3,000 megawatts of energy and provide electricity to 1 million homes. Uh, so for more information about the power company of Wyoming and the wind energy project, I, I've provided a, uh, a web address down there at the bottom of the slide. The conservation measures were implemented across the ranch to benefit sage grouse and other wildlife species and to assess the benefits of the conservation measures and determine the potential impacts of wind energy development on sage grouse, the Power Company of Wyoming funded research which involved tagging and monitoring of hen sage grouse. In addition, Power Company of Wyoming, Wyoming Game and Fish Department, and the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station funded a sage grouse research program evaluating sage grouse brood ecology. So as Lauren mentioned hey, in 2000, yep. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, someone just said that it was a bit more difficult to hear you, so I'm not sure if you can get closer to your phone. Um, but if you can or speak a little louder, that'd be great. Sure, is this better? Uh, I think yeah. so. OK, sorry about that. Yeah, Thanks. so uh, as, as you mentioned, in 2010, the NWCC requested proposals for research related to sage grouse and wind energy development. And so our team proposed a companion study of male sage grouse ecology, which was funded. And that's what I'm discussing today. This is a map of the Overland Trail Ranch where we completed our research. It's approximately 320,000 acres of checkerboard ownership, which is about half private and half public. And again, it's located in Carbon County, Wyoming. There were two general uh, proposed areas for development, uh, the Choke Cherry and Sierra Madre, which you can see on the map there. Uh, also shown are the leks in the nearby area that we counted throughout the study. You can see their general size by the, the size of the dots there. Our overall research objectives are to determine whether male sage grouse respond to wind energy development using a before-after control impact design with control and treatment areas varying distances from development. Uh, specifically, we're in the before development phase, so there is no construction that happened during our part of the study. So our objective was to study the male lek dynamics, survival, movements, and resource selection. Then during, during and after construction, we'll collect similar information that will allow us to determine the potential impacts of wind energy development on sage grass. So from 2011 to 2014, we captured sage grouse using spotlighting and hoop netting techniques, as can be seen there in the bottom left photo. Uh, we tagged male sage grouse with two types of transmitters. We tagged 145 adult or yearling males with 30 gram solar powered global positioning system platform transmitter terminals, also called GPS PTTs, which I include there in the slide. Uh, you can see an example of one of those in the top right photo. We also tagged 137 adult or yearling males, 66 juvenile males, and 62 juvenile females with 30 gram or 15 gram very high frequency or VHF transmitters, which can be seen in the bottom right photo. And we attached all these transmitters to sage grouse rumps with a elastic leg loop harness. The GPS PTTs collected about five to nine locations each day, depending on the season. And we downloaded these locations every four to eight days. Uh, since the start of the study in April 2011, we've collected over 184,600 locations of males uh, tagged with the GPS PTTs. We stopped tagging males in spring 2014, so there's currently only one male still active in the field. 
the top right figure here is an example of the location data from one individual uh, traveling from spring to summer range. So you can see the high frequency and accuracy of locations we collect from GPS PTTs really facilitate our analysis of sage grass movement and resource selection. We conducted monthly aerial telemetry flights to locate sage grass tagged with the VHF transmitters. And because the locations were not as frequent or accurate as locations from GPS PTTs, we only use that data for survival analyses. As part of our evaluation of lek dynamics, we monitored up to 58 leks on and near the Overland Trail Ranch from 2011 to 2014. And then the SWCA environmental consultants continued monitoring those same leks in 2015 and 2016. As you can see in this table, the average number of males per occupied lek was lowest in 2013 and then increased into 2016, which is pretty similar to the trend witnessed throughout Wyoming. While conducting lek counts, we evaluated sightability of males on leks, which can be interpreted as the probability of detecting a male sage grass on a lek if it is present. Uh, this is an important concept to study because what counts are used to assess sage grass population trends. And if not all males are detected and male detection is differentially affected by attributes of the lek, then population trend information could be inaccurate. To facilitate this research, we attached a unique color combination of lake bands to each tagged male, as you can see in this photo. We determined which males were detected using two observers on leks one that had access to telemetry equipment and the other that did not. Uh, the tagged individuals that were known to be present on the lek due to the presence of their radio signal, but were not sighted by the individual with that telemetry equipment were considered undetected. In addition to detected undetected data, we recorded, recorded weather data, sage grass behavior characteristics, such as the number of sage grass surrounding each male. Uh, as well as vegetation characteristics for, for each detected and undetected sage grass. And we use this information to determine the probability of detecting males on leks, as well as the factors that influence detection. So as far as our sightability results, we, we found that the probability of detecting a male on a lek was fairly high. On average, we detected 87% of tagged males on leks, and that value ranged from about 77 to 93 percent, depending on the lek. Our ability to t detect males on leks was most influenced by sagebrush height and snow cover. As you can see in the figures to the right, as sagebrush height increased, the probability of detecting a male decreased, while the probability of detecting a male increased with increasing snow cover. So by accounting for imperfect detection, we estimated that abundance estimates using left count data on our study site were underestimated by 17 to 19 percent each year. So another component of left dynamics we studied was left attendance, or the probability of a male attending a LEC. We used location data obtained from males tagged with the GPS PTTs and lek boundaries we mapped each spring to determine the days that males attended leks and how long they attended. We programmed the GPS PTTs to collect the location every hour from about 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. in spring to facilitate the analysis of lek attendance. We found that the average and peak daily lek attendance estimates varied annually, as you can see by those figures down below. Uh, average daily attendance ranged from 36.3% in 2011 to about 79.1% in 2014. And the peak attendance dates ranged from 8th of April in 2012 to 12th of May in 2011. Uh, one of the most influential factors on left attendance other than date was, was precipitation. Males were less likely to attend LECs if it was raining or snowing. So the variability in LEC attendance rates demonstrates the importance of completing at least three counts per LEC, as is typically recommended. If males are not attending LECs on the days counting is conducted, then population estimates could be inaccurate. We also researched interlake movements by males, which can be interpreted 
as a probability of males moving between one or multiple licks during the breeding season. Again, we use the location data acquired from males tagged as GPS PTTs to determine whether a male moved among licks. So from 2011 to 2014, average daily male interlick movement probabilities were fairly low, ranging from 0.3 to 1%. And this equated to average seasonal interlick movement probabilities ranging from 5 to 42%. So throughout the study, approximately one-third of tagged males made at least one interlick movement. And these interlick movements could result in males being double counted, so counts should be completed when interlick movements are least likely. And males were more likely to move between licks early in the season, peaking March 6th. And movements more often occurred to and from high elevation licks. Uh, we feel this finding could be due to early season snowfall at higher elevations. Uh, we made an interesting observation in 2014 that illustrates this, this finding, in that we identified three males while monitoring a lick at about 7,700 feet elevation. Then a few days later, after a large snowfall, we identified the same three tagged males at a lek about 10 kilometers away with an elevation of about 7,250 feet, 7,250 feet. Uh, the, the three individuals then returned to the high elevation lek after a few days without snow. So in that year, we, we know at least three and probably more males were double counted. Thus, again, to prevent double counting, recommend like near large elevation gradients not be counted directly after uh, heavy snowstorms. Our next objective was to estimate annual survival of adult and yearling males and overwinter survival of juvenile males and females. Both the GPS PGTs and the VHF transmitters had a mortality signal that would engage when the transmitter stopped moving. So we located the tags as soon as possible after the mortality signal started, but due to the possibility of scavenging, we weren't able to determine the cause of sage-grass mortality with 100% certainty. Uh, because of that, we, we can, can't really draw any, any conclusions about the cause of mortality. We completed separate survival analyses for birds tagged with GPS, PTTs, and VHF transmitters due to the different frequency of locations we received from each transmitter type. There wasn't a large difference in survival of males tagged with GPS PTTs compared with males tagged with VHF transmitters. As you can see, the survival of adult yearling males tagged with GPS PTTs ranged from 21% in 2011 to 38% in 2013, while the survival of adult and yearling males tagged with VHF transmitters ranged from about 27% in 2011 to 41% in 2013. And those confidence intervals overlap considerably. Overwinter survival of juvenile males and females was similar at about 41% and 46% respectively. Uh, these estimates are a little low, but generally within the range of other published survival rates for males. We quantify sage grass movements by calculating seasonal home range size and determining the timing, duration, and distance of migratory movements between seasons. And the migratory movement, we consider movements uh, greater than approximately 10 kilometers. Uh, we use GPS PTT location data to identify grouse in year-specific year seasons, uh, determined by the date the grouse began migration between seasonal ranges. Uh, we're, we're also in the process of using various metrics to estimate the fidelity to these migration corridors. This figure shows the average male home range size for spring, summer, and winter seasons each year. The error bars are the 95% confidence intervals, and the numbers above the bars denote the sample size for each year. As you can see, the seasonal home range sizes were fairly consistent across years. Uh, spring and summer home range sizes were similar in size, while winter home range ranges were approximately twice the size of other seasons. This figure depicts the timing, duration, and distance of the interseasonal migrations. The width of the colored lines show the duration of the migratory period, while the height of the line display, displays the distance of the migration. 
And again, the error bars are the 95% confidence intervals for migration distance. So winter-spring migrations usually occurred in late February, late February or early March. The spring to summer migrations occurred in late May, and the summer to winter migrations occurred in late October and November. The males migrated generally the greatest distances during summer to winter periods on average, and the, the longest migration we witnessed was, was 58 kilometers. We're also currently evaluating migration corridor fidelity using some dynamic Brownian bridge movement models. And this is determined whether males use the same migratory pathways between seasonal ranges each year. And we're still working uh, on, this, on this analysis and writing, so we don't have any results to report at this moment on this subject. We're going to use the locations, again, from males tagged with GPS PTTs and randomly placed locations in a paired available design to determine what resources males selected in summer and winter during diurnal and nocturnal periods. We're going to use a multi-scale approach to evaluate resource selection, including landscape, home range, and microsite scales. The landscape, and micro, uh, the landscape and home range scales are still in progress, uh, so we have no results to report for those. But in terms of the microsite selection, uh, we, we completed microsite selection analyses by measuring vegetation at 147 male and 441 paired random sites. And these are only sites microsites during the summer at diurnal periods. In general, music sites with more visual obstruction, forbs, grasses, and taller vegetation were selected. And so this just shows an example of a site used by a male during the day in summer versus an available site measured the same day. And you can note the, the tall vegetation at the use site compared to the shorter, sparser vegetation at the available site there on the right. So in the future, we hope to collect similar data during construction and post-construction periods. Again, all we have right now is, is before construction data. And so with, with that extra data during construction and post-construction periods, we can evaluate the, the response of sage grouse, the potential response of sage grouse to wind energy development. So with that, I'd like to thank, again, all those who supported the, the project and all those who joined today. And uh, I'll take any questions with that. That's all I've got. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. You've got some really amazing pictures in there. <laughs> Thanks. So as a reminder, if you have questions, please uh, type them into the box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and send them over. Uh, we've got um, one come through asking if the leg bands increased predation at all. Oh, uh, well, we didn't study that, uh, so I can't really comment on that. I guess my initial thought would be likely not, given they barely, uh, they don't seem to um, affect the sage grass movements all, at all or affect their daily activities. So, but again, I can't really comment on whether that was, if there was any effect or not. Okay, thanks. That's the only question I'm seeing right now, so we'll, oh, here's another. Ah, another uh, shout out for the nice photos. <laughs> okay, we've got a question for Chad. Chad, are you still on the phone line? I think you are. Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, the question is, how do you identify where the sage grouse habitat areas are to ensure proper sighting? Kind of a broad question. <laughs> you can speak to that at all. Yeah, I think um, you know I think that they're very lect-centric species, and uh, we observed that in our study. 
Um, it just depends on the extent of the habitat that they are going to use, and it's really specific to each study area. And so, um, yeah, I guess I would I would recommend um, starting at the LEC center and um, and know that sage-grouse can migrate up to, to 10 kilometers to utilize different uh, habitat sites during their annual cycle. So uh, it, it does really depend, and it really depends on, on the availability of suitable habitat. So um, it, it varies project to project, and, and unfortunately we can't just put a, a buffer around a lek and say, you know, with confidence that they're going to use this. It's dependent on um, the habitat that they actually use and, and what they're selecting for. So um, it is really site specific. So. Great, thanks. Any other, I know we have some other members of the research teams on, if anyone else wants to, to add anything on that note. Okay. We don't, oh, here we go. Okay, uh, this question is asking, um, how will the pre-construction data you've collected on microsites or large scale, or, or at the large scale, influence uh, turbine siting at the Chokecherry Sierra Madre site? Um, yeah, so I can't really comment on that in terms of all that goes into deciding where turbines are placed. I don't know if there's somebody from PCW or SWCA on the line that might be able to explain that more, but sorry, I can't really comment on that myself. Yeah. Yep, understood. Hey Chris, this I is don't... John. And if I under this is John K. Meyer. If I if I understand the question, it was whether or not or how the data were in, incorporated into siting? Yes, the data that, that the teams have been collecting. And John, can you just introduce yourself real quick and your relationship yeah, to the my project? Oh. I'm John K. Meyer with SWCA. I'm a research uh, associate of Chris's. Um, and we've been working on the Choke Cherry Sierra Madre project for for a, a while now. So um, the I, I guess from a siting perspective, the data uh, have been useful for siting purposes and ensuring that um, we understand the dynamics around lek locations and seasonal use patterns and, and migration patterns, you know, the movement patterns that Chris uh, Chris illustrated in his presentation. So they have been extremely useful in identifying those patterns of use in the home ranges during different different times of the year for purposes of, of trying to minimize impacts um, as much as possible. So yeah, I'd, I'd say they've they've been very useful and, and have been uh, um, used during the siting process uh, extensively, so. Great, thank you. Okay, we've a couple other questions have come in. Um, well, I'm just I want to um, get questions for you, Chad. So I'm looking to see um, if there are any. Uh, for you. Um, So there's a couple questions um, for the Chuck Cherry Sierra Madre, Madre study about um, kind of the timeline and post-construction research, and um, so I'm not sure if there's anything you all can can say in that regard um, from from the research team's perspective. Um, unfortunately, um, the only time that worked for this webinar was a time that uh, representative from the, the developer was, was in, unable to join us. Um, so Chris or John or, or anyone else from that team, is there anything you can say um, about timeline and post-construction study? Yeah, it, I yeah. guess John would probably know more about that, yeah. Yeah, Lauren, this is John again. And, and uh, yeah, it's unfortunate Gary Miller wasn't able to, to join the call. The project has, um, initiated construction activities for some of the ground-based infrastructure. So the internal haul road has started, uh, construction has been initiated for that portion of the project. And uh, in terms of monitoring the effects of that, we are continuing to, um, through Power Company of Wyoming's um, 
female study, we're, we're evaluating what the potential impacts uh, to grouse would be during the construction phase of the project. Um, construction in general is planned over the next several years um, and will be ongoing um, probably for the next, you know, three to four to five years. Um, and then, yeah, after that, obviously, would be the post-construction phase of, of the research effort. So we're kind of in, in between that before, after, we're kind of in the middle, you know, the during portion of construction, which I think is an important element to understand as well, is, is how construction affects patterns of use and demographics out there on the project site. Great, thank you. Um, Chris, can you say, um, someone was kind of asking about copies of, of the, the study, and I know you guys have uh, a lot of publications that you've been working on, some of which are out and some which may still be in process, So, and we'll make sure that um, as part of the materials that are distributed after this webinar, links to all of the publications that, ha that have been um, released in journals are accessible to all of you, but do you want to say anything more about kind of your publication status uh, and plans? for the work to date? Yeah, so I guess up to date in terms of the male portion of the study, we've we've had two of the Lex Dynamics papers, the Citability paper, uh, the male Citability on Lex was accepted for publication as well as um, Interlex movements, I believe, and we're going through revisions of a uh, of the Lex Attendance paper. Uh, we're, we're currently involved in some internal reviews of survival and and movement and resource selection uh, papers and still finishing up some of those analyses. So we're hoping those will be on the table here pretty soon. But uh, yeah, in terms of the, the Lex Dynamics, we're, we're got most of that published or it's in the process of being published. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, got two more questions here, um, and I think kind of the focus of this question is asking uh, if you can say a bit more about um, the work on LEC detectability and, and the purposes of, of that part of the work. Yes, yeah. uh, so citability, I assume, is what that question I think so, yeah. Referring to. Okay. Yeah, well, so part of the importance of LEC counts is to to establish a, a population trend over time and LEC counts are the best way to, to do that. And so the idea between, behind the citability surveys is that not all males are likely detected while doing those counts. And so getting an idea of how many uh, or what percentage of males you're missing while doing counts is important. So you can potentially, depending on the attributes of the LEC uh, and the timing of the count and all that, that you can determine uh, approximately what proportion of the males you're, you're missing that are actually present on the LEC. And so I guess the, the bigger picture there is that we want to try to make our, our uh, data from LEC counts as, as accurate as possible. Great, thank you. Uh, and I'm going to read this question. I'm not sure if I understand it, but we'll see if you guys um, can can speak to it. So this is asking, will the Hansen study uh, compare effects on habitat use in relation to both density of disturbances as well as distance from closest um, disturbance? Basically, LeBeau et al. seem to have found that disturbance density is most important to habitat use, while other studies have simply looked at distance from nearest turbine. Um, that's likely, yeah, we're, we're likely to look at all those types of questions once once turbines are built, and that's also portion of the control treatment design where some of the treatment areas have are closer to, to turbines and, and more dense turbine areas versus the control sites that are farther from turbines without, you know, very low density turbine development. So we are looking to to include those questions in, in our future research. Great, thank you. All right, so I, I'm not seeing any other questions that have come in. 
So um, before we wrap up, I just want to mention to everyone um, that the Wind Wildlife Research Meeting, um, sorry, another question just came in here, um, asking if there's, if you might have a recommendation to change how we calculate greater sage grouse populations based on what counts based on this research. Uh, you know, I, I think I got, overall, I, go I don't really have any recommendation. If I get the question correctly, I don't I think have any. It's about any, the decidability questions. Yeah, I don't have any recommendations, any, any better way of estimating sage grouse populations other than what counts, if that's the question. Uh, just the general recommendation is to try to, if, if possible, account for those portion of males that may be not detected on, on LEX that are actually out there. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, so wanted to mention that the Wind Wildlife Research Meeting, which is um, uh, the every other year meeting where um, folks get together to present and hear about the latest research on wind energy and wildlife, and that takes place the week after Thanksgiving, November 28th through December, well, sorry, 29th through December 2nd. And I um, gather a lot of you are already registered, and we hope many of you will be able to join us. Um, we've got about 325 folks registered so far. It's very exciting. Um, and thank you to all of our sponsors for that meeting. Um, we're really looking forward to it. And uh, thank you all for your time and attention today. I know folks have a lot on their minds um, and appreciate um, Chris and Chad, um, you presenting, and everyone um, online for joining us. So I think we can wrap up. Take care, everyone. <laughs>